we can get on board here. Hello, hello, are we on? Are we on, we on? Sorry we're late if we're on and you can hear this. Oh, you know what, maybe, no, they should be able to hear us. There we go, get that out of there. Hi, Coach Kevin. Hello. How you doing today? Okay. We are live, let's see if we have, we're live. Oh, here we are, we have sound. You ready to do some uh, push up sit ups and squats? Uh huh. As we are, what are, you, what, are you, what are you smirking about over there? I'm just ready to do my. Sorry, we're late. I had a phone call to our. I want to apologize to each and every one of our 77 members. Or, 77? We have 77. We might even have 78. I don't know. Let me adjust this camera. That's crazy. Uh, I had a little, a little phone call with some old friends who were back in New York City, and it's fun to catch up with them. That's fun. They seem well. They, I mean, they're, they're doing really well. Uh, Tucker was actually one of the, the law school we in, and, uh, and we, were, we were at the same firm, we were at the same office. Oh, and then Laura's very interesting. She's working for the city, working, protecting New York City uh, residents from uh, from COVID. Her name is Lars? Laura. Oh. Sorry, maybe I'm slurring <laughs> my speech here. It's like, huh. Oh, oh, here we go. I deadlifted today and my knees are bad. Oh, Why are you? That means you, you did a poor, poor job of deadlifting that if is your knees true. are bad. That is true. You, your knees should not feel bad at all. It's like saying, you're, I did squats so my back hurts. <laughs> well, you gotta work. You fix your squat technique there. Are we, our heads are still, I think your head is still too tall. I want to make sure that you are captured in all your glory, Kevin. Yeah, I was trying different ways of deadlifting. And then mean, mean the, some, there's only like one right way, right? Like how many ways are there to deadlift? There are different ways. Are there? Uh -huh. Like there's a right way and then there's like 25 wrong ways? There's like deadlifting and then you could do like sumo deadlifts, right? And then... Is that where you deadlift a sumo wrestler? No, it's where you have your... That's your a joke, I know. Right? And then that's literally the only one I have, so... How about this one? Is this a good one where you do this? Um, isn't that how Bruce Lee threw out his back? No, he was doing good mornings. I don't do good mornings for that reason. Oh. I don't know, my legs are weird, so I'm trying to figure out a comfortable yet safe way to deadlift, and it's fun. It just takes a little bit of experimenting. Should we talk about a thing? What do you want to talk about? You have anything in mind? I don't know. I don't want to force it. You don't want to force it? <laughs> yeah. Our daily our daily musings? All of it starts seeming disingenuous. What's that? Disingenuous? Disingenuous. Disingenuous, not a word. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, it can be a word if you want it to be. I mean... But it's not a word that's like in the dictionary. That makes sense. Disingenuous. Alright. I don't Go know ahead. if that's... Or, or I think what you mean is like not genuine. Like yeah. not... Yeah. Like forced in a way. Disingenuous means like unauthentic. I'm not. Uh, I'm not actually being truthful. Yeah. Kind of making, or, or I'm not being honest or sincere. I'm making a disingenuous argument. You know, sort yeah. of thing. Non-authentic. I was reading a bunch of Wikipedia articles about punk culture. About what? Punk culture. Yeah. What about them? Uh, just like uh, how they highly value authenticity, mm -hmm. and so like yeah. they have. You know, a certain set of values typically, and they kind of shift from subgroup to subgroup to subgroup, but I think collectively among them, they all highly value authenticity and reject the idea of like selling out. Yes. Which is interesting. Why? I don't know. Uh, I feel like um, not all cultures necessarily highly value authenticity in the That's true. Groups. That's true. So to have a subculture that does 
I think is, I don't know, worth looking at twice. And why does it seem different? Or it made some sort of comparative judgment. Well, if you ever wonder, like, why punk rock uh, was so popular, you know, back in the 70s, you should go and listen to a little bit of prog rock. Prog rock? Prog rock. Like Czech Republic? No, prog rock? Not prog rock, but not, not that prog. Oh. PRG. P-R-O-G. Pro, pro, like progressive. Prog, yes. Prog. Prag. Prog. Prog. Prog rock? I mean, there's been a lot of, a lot of things written about, you know, the rise, the, sh the rise and fall of prog rock. But I don't even know if you listen to enough rock. of that. What is prog rock? Could you give me an example? Yes. Or the band, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, like what? Wait, is, it, is there a band called Yes? So yes, there is a band called Yes. Who's on first? <laughs> um, but it's like highly, it's like over-intellectualized, <laughs> uh, really overproduced. Um, it sounds perfect. There's a lot of like capes involved. Oh, I like you capes. Know. I recently a lot of long, I mean, like, uh, I'm trying to think of all, like, yes is maybe <laughs> one of them that kind of springs to my mind. I like yes, by the way, not everything you do, but. I've never heard of A, progressive rock, or B, yes. Really? You've never heard of yes? So is, how is punk rock related to progressive rock? Think of them as, uh, Thesis and antithesis, and prog rock is essentially like was ascended at that moment. Think of it this way: or uh, prog rock. Or you know, that? like at the end of the '80s, you had like hair metal, right? You had like like Guns N' Roses was probably the best example of, uh, of like the best of hair metal, right? Mm -hmm. Motley Crue, Poison. Um, you know, think about like neon, you know, guys were wearing like fishnets and like long dyed hair or like crazy stuff like that. Uh, uh, and then, you know, what, what took over from hair metal? Did they go into grunge? Grunge. Time? Grunge is like the opposite of that, right? Like guys were wearing flannel and jeans, <laughs> right? But grunge isn't punk, is it? No, but I'm just saying, like, in terms of attitude, you had a, a guy, like, Kurt Cobain was famous, who was deeply ambivalent, right? Like, he was, he was famous for being anti-commercial, and he actually did not, uh, even in his public statements, uh, did not like the fact that they were so, I mean, they were, they, they were vaulted into, you know, the popularity, you know, the, the public consciousness, and they became like this hyper successful, hyper scrutinized, hyper idolized band where he was like, that band was it. Yeah. And, uh, and he didn't want, did not like that. Well, I mean, you talk about not wanting to sell out. I mean, yeah. it was like he didn't have a choice. Yeah. You know, it's just like one day, everyone, you just imagine like one day, you're just playing in a coffee house in Seattle or wherever he was, <laughs> and then one day, just, yeah. you know, like, a hundred million dollars shows up in your bank account, and they're like, they just booked you for a bunch of shows. Yeah. Your management, and you're you're the, you have the number one album, and you're like, wait a minute, I didn't I didn't sign up for any of this. Like I just like to play my music to a bunch of people in Seattle yeah. or wherever he was. I'm just making that up. I don't know where he actually it's, was. It's like someone getting rich publishing communist literature. <laughs> or you're just someone saying like you you know like you just won this lottery ticket. You now have. $100 million. Well, yeah, and yeah. all the problems that go along with that. And you may be a person who, like, you're like, I don't like having lots of money. That's the thing. That's, if that's your identity, if your identity is, like, kind of a rejection of, of fame and, uh, like, you know, public, huge public recognition and uh, material wealth, and then suddenly uh, all of these ideals that you have cause you to become famous and wealthy, like, what do you do with that? Like, how do you maintain who you are and like, knowing that that is what got you this stuff and at the same time continue to live life in a way... You can't. Like, I you mean, cannot, you can't live life a normal way that you want to live if you are, you know, the most popular, if you're the, the lead singer of the most popular man in the world. So, like, is authenticity kind of an illusion or is it something that we have any control over or is it something that is sometimes like just taken out of our control in certain situations? Uh, it's a bit of authenticity. 
I, I, I mean, you can be, you can be very authentic to yourself, whatever that is. I mean, that's going to change from person to person. Some people will be say authenticity means you can't sell out. Whereas other people like commercial success is how I defend, define myself. You know, so I think it is something that is. I mean, you have your own definition that you live by, and then you also have your community, right, of people, of your audience, who will say whether or not you are authentic, you know, and sincere. You know, in terms of true to your values, whatever that, you know, wherever the group's values are. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there are people like this. Always happens, right? Like, there's a band or a artist who is more or less kind of popular within their small little group, and then they blow up. And what happens? What are they accused of? You sold out. <coughs> yeah. Right. And we don't like you anymore because back when you were, you know, I'm trying to think of like the Grateful Dead. I remember, you know, the Grateful Dead were, I mean, obviously a very popular, well-known band. Yeah. But there was a moment. Uh, in the 80s where they released Touch of Grey, mm -hmm. which is a very kind of popular, everyone loved I mean, Touch of Grey became like a big hit it was played on the radio and too, all the, too many normal people liked it all of a sudden, <laughs> all the regular people and they had a name for them called, I think, Greyheads or Touchheads or something like that but a way to differentiate you, oh, them you started to like this band when they were top 40 yeah. I liked the band when they were yeah. nobody, I mean, nobody like my mom went to go see a Grateful Dead, right? Like, yeah. but I mean, they've been around a long time. I was born next to them. Whatever, you know, or, or the same thing happened with The Cure. The Cure was, was a relatively obscure, you know, band uh, that you would never hear on the radio. Yeah. And then at some point, either late 80s or early 90s, they released an album, I think it was Fascination Street or something like that, where it's like, and they were like very kind of dark, like depressingly dark, but like, they were obscure and they weren't like happy. They weren't a happy band. And then all of a sudden they released like Friday I'm in Love. Yeah, depressed emo teenagers everywhere started listening to The Cure. Probably around late 90s, early 2000s. But then they released, <laughs> but then they released Friday I'm in Love and everyone's like, what is this? This is not, you know, this is very commercial. You know, their videos are being played on MTV all of a sudden. And then if you, if you always thought of them as some sort of countercultural touchstone, now they are culture, right? Like, there's an old book that I used to, uh, that I love. It's a collection of essays called Commodify Your Descent. And basically it's about how capitalism always wins by assimilating counterculture, Yeah. right? So whatever it is that is rebellion or rebellious, Eventually it they, just, they just sell it, right? They just sell it. They sell your rebellion back to you. And so it's like the best way to deal with Rebellion or counterculture is like, hey, we're just gonna repackage this and sell it to everybody. So naturally, the best way to, it. to rebel is to con conform. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have that kind of like, you know, ironic. Yeah. Right. Like. Well, you're always rebelling away from something. Um, anyway. You that, can get that book, Commodify Your Descent. I recommend it. It's really good. That well, you just said reminded me that happened to Metallica too. They have a very successful band at some point. Yeah, like right after, once it was Load and Reload. No, right after the Black Album. Because the Black Album was like a mega hit. Mm -hmm. They had that music video, everyone loved it, and it was like like that good blend between poppy and heavy metal. It's accessible, yeah. right? It's something that would go on the radio and your, your mother yeah. Or your uncle or whatever. Like it's not going to be like, what devil music? Like, you your know? dad would like it but wouldn't admit it, but your grandfather probably wouldn't like it. Like, it was right on that edge. But it wouldn't be offensive to you. Like, your grandfather wouldn't say, yeah. get this garbage off the room. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know. But, um, yeah, and then... He went to Frank Sinatra and... Load and Reload came out, and then everyone started making fun of him. And people I know have started making fun of, this is unrelated, Eminem too. Yo. Ethan doesn't like Eminem anymore. I love Eminem. But then I stopped listening to Eminem after like, <laughs> whatever the album was that was had Stan on it. You know, like, then I just stopped listening. That was like the second album. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But he yes. was crazy popular. I mean, that, that was, yeah. I mean, he's been popular a long time, but at some point, like, popularity becomes... It's not as special, right? You don't feel like this connection because, like, everyone likes this person. Yeah, because, like, it definitely affects the artist. There's no way it won't. Uh, well, well, you start, you know, when you, when you labor in obscurity, I mean, I've had enough, I mean, I had a couple big cases involving the music industry, 
And, you know, at some point when you're relatively small and your audience is small, you know, there's not as much scrutiny on you from either the public or the label or your management. But once you become identified as like a money maker, they, there's a lot of pressure that's put onto you to like continue making money, you know? So the record labels just want more of the same out of you. You know, like, oh, you made a, you had a gold or a platinum album? Like, well, this is the formula. Keep churning this out. Pump the wells till it's dry. You know? So there's a, the business of, of entertainment really comes to the forefront. And if you just wanted to be a relatively obscure but signed, you know, uh, art act, an artist, you know, now you've got record executives, you know, and then you have to promote. You know, you're not the artist anymore. Now you've got to go out and advertise. That sounds terrible. And market. Ugh. And, you have, and you get sponsored by Pepsi. <laughs> you know, and Doritos. That's the dream. And they want you to, like, work. I want that Doritos money. I mean, that's good money, let me tell you. It's no joke. I mean, I guess I would morally have no problem with the Doritos sponsorship because I really do love Doritos. But, I don't know. What's the, is there like an acceptable level of selling out? Like, would you wear a Doritos gi for the rest of your life? How much do they pay me? That's a good question. How much would it cost? Well, I mean, it always depends on like, what is your actual, what's your agenda, right, as a person? You know what I mean? Like, if someone said to me, uh, you know, there, this doesn't happen as much anymore, but like early days in jiu-jitsu, there were a lot of people who were selling some highly questionable, you know, instructional material, shall we say. Uh -huh. And the wild west days. If you were to say to me, hey, Rich, I need you to, like, vouch for me, <laughs> right? Like, and I'm going to pay you really well, right? And I, and I say to myself, well, is it more important to me to actually be respected <laughs> as a you know, as a person with a real opinion. Yeah. Or, uh, is it more important to me to make, get a piece of that money? Sometimes rent's due tomorrow. I mean, I, <laughs> look, I mean, that's an economic situation everyone has to confront in their own lives. You know, I'm not gonna begrudge anyone who, yeah, is trying to pay money, you know, pay their <laughs> bills. You know, they can get some of that sweet, sweet, fake endorsement money. I so mean, but like, no, like, how much would it cost for you to wear nothing but things covered in Doritos logos? Like everything if, you if wear. the Frito Lay people are watching right now, uh, I would say it's your opening ask. Yeah, I mean, my for just a Dorito ghee. Yeah, you're Dorito. you're you're gonna be the. I'm gonna be the chip, yeah. chip, chip jitsu. Is you, that the new Brazilian chip jitsu? Sure. We also have to rebrand the academy. Okay. Dorito uh, Samurai Jiu Jitsu. And, and you know, this is perfect because the triangle that we all use for Jiu Jitsu <laughs> could just be like a Dorito chip. Oh, we should be, uh, uh, isn't it like Golden Triangle? Or like it's a, isn't a Dorito mean like Golden Triangle? Dorito? I don't know. I don't know what the. It's something the golden, but. Derivation I think of it's Doritos. Triangle, but uh, we get Golden Triangle Jiu Jitsu. That'd be funny. And it's all just Doritos. We could sell Doritos as post workout. That'd be good. Uh, not very much. It wouldn't, <laughs> I am. I am available. I, you know, my my credibility is definitely no. I mean, I don't know. Uh, or what if you had to do one major competition in Doritos no Gi attire? Uh, I mean, at this point, I don't think anybody would would care. Uh, <laughs> what any, you know, you could show up. And, uh, what, what if it was depends? I mean, I, I, I'm soon going to be does a product, customer, it depends. I have does no... the product matter? Like, I mean, I really like Doritos. Uh, you might not, right? So Doritos might not be the product for you. I mean, I love Doritos. I don't know anybody who <laughs> doesn't love Doritos, to be honest. People say they don't like Doritos, but I think they're just lying. I've never seen someone eat just one Doritos. I've never seen anybody turn down Doritos. <laughs> I think they're little goldens, little golden triangles. I don't know. Anyway, do you remember 3D Doritos? Uh, aren't they called bugles? No, those are bugles. Those are little also delicious. Which fingers? No, the, the ones where they were like Doritos but poofed in the middle. No, I don't remember those. Huh? Did they like cheese in the middle or something? Because that would no, be awesome. just just air. So you were like paying for cheese in there for less 
Dorito per bag. But it visually it seemed like more Doritos per and bag. And it's like more crunch. Like, uh, yeah, it's like double the crunch. Now, were they actually a, a good approximation of the original Dorito? I mean, the flavoring was the same. Like, it's still cheese powder. But ah, uh, delicious cheese powder. It was just like an extra dimension. I don't know how many. Sets yeah, I was about to say I've stopped counting. We're running out. I'm trying to think if there's anyone that, in, in jiu-jitsu, that people think of as more or less legit uh, in jiu-jitsu. Ju what do you mean? I mean, there are definitely like, brands. Like authentic people? Well, Marcelo. You know, there's certain people that, like, I think everyone agree are, like, they've, they're like the Hall of Famers, right? Like, the guys and women who, they've just won a lot, uh -huh. right? And, and, there, and they, there's no, I don't know how much selling out is actually available mm -hmm. to people um, who achieve a lot in jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, you can say as like an athlete, like if you play basketball, mm -hmm. you know, and you, and you always, you just love Adidas, mm -hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden Nike comes along and says, we're going to give you hundred million dollars. And you're like, <laughs> I love Nike, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, is that selling out? Well, like, now yeah, you have a really good reason to love Nike because, I mean, what was your reason for loving Adidas anyway? Uh, no, I mean, I think, like, you know, if you're if you run or you play if you play a sport, I think most people like the way that shoes feel. Like I'll give you an example. Like for me, uh, when I was running back way back, I mean I did not like Nike. In fact, yeah. even Nike for basketball, I didn't. I wasn't a really big fan of Nike because they they, they 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 would hurt my feet in a certain way. Sure. They just weren't comfortable. Yeah. Um, but I really liked I really like another brand uh, for running. Um, and I would just always wear that brand. Yeah, but I feel like tying brand loyalty to authenticity feels icky. Well, I'm just using it as an example, right? Like, so let's say, you know, in jiu-jitsu, I think the classic example is- Shoyu roll? Is a gi, right? Yeah. And shoyu rolls are good gis. I like shoyu roll gis. I've never had like a bad shoyu roll gi. Yeah. I don't like the size, they changed their sizing at one point. Yeah. And so I think their sizing's a little bit funny for me now. It used to fit perfectly and now, like I mean, me too. Done. And now I'm not an A2. It's not because I just got fat. <laughs> right? I knew you were going to say that. It just doesn't, like, the, the, the sleeves got a lot longer. They used to size a lot smaller. Um, so that, you know, naturally the A2 was, like, small. Like, it fit my frame pretty naturally. Did they change uh, for, like, washing expectations? I don't know why they changed, but they did. Um, but, I mean, there's a lot of gi companies that offer sponsorships to athletes. And you see the athletes. Uh, now, a lot of athletes don't sit around and talk about how great their gis are, anyway. And I've never heard a, uh, an athlete blame their gi for anything, right? It's not like, you know, golfers and, and tennis players will often blame their racket or their club for whatever. And I don't think that's the case for jujitsu people, but, you know. Yeah. But if, well, that'd be weird. Like, if you're competing and you don't have, like, your gi situation figured out, like, you're, you're probably not in a situation to complain about it. <laughs> I just don't, I think you can put a gi on any world champion, and they're probably still going to wind up being a world champion. I don't think the gi is the difference. I think the Amongst the decent, you know, like the generally... I think feeling comfortable in your gi is very important in the, the competition aspect. I wouldn't want to go out and compete in a gi that I'd never worn before, and it was all weird. And I mean, no, no one would, but I, I, all I'm saying is that even if you probably have put Marcelo Garcia in an ill-fitted <laughs> gi, he, he would probably still do the same things that he would normally do. He's not going to be like all this normal gi. people, but I feel like at the top of the top of to the top... To me, the gi is the most important thing of all. Like, my game is not, if it's not, gi's not fitted perfectly, I'm just not going to perform very well. It's really 100% about the gi. At the top, it's about the little differences, right? So I feel like you could be thrown off. You know, maybe he'll get to the finals, but if he's feeling wonky in the finals, it might not be the same thing. I think you could put a potato sack over Marcelo Garcia <laughs> and he'd still 
do pretty well. Yeah, Marcelo Garcia could be the, the exception. Or Hodger, or any, I mean, it's not, I mean, I just don't know anyone who's like, you know, I've never seen anyone come out and be like, oh, because my belt came untied, or you don't find, no, I've never I mean, heard anyone say, no, my no, rash guard. That could be a legitimate reason something goes wrong, but you'd never hear uh, like a self-respecting person, <laughs> well, that's like, what I'm saying, you know, right? verbally cite that, but they could still like, think that in their brains, like, man, I should have worn my, my lucky gi, you know, or da 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 da, the gi that I, have competed in, and I love competing in, it's like my game. That's a quick way to losing respect in jiu-jitsu. Well, if you talk about it, just don't That's what I'm saying, <laughs> right? Like, if you stood up there and be like, well, the reason well, I lost was because yeah. the, my gi was a little bit longer than what I'm used to, and I had to borrow my friend's gi, because yeah. my other gi was wet, or dirty, or ripped, or whatever. <laughs> People would just laugh at you, right? Like, you'd lose some respect in that situation. Yeah. But, uh, there's not a lot of sponsorship money in jiu-jitsu, I don't think. Yet. Not for people who complain about the deeds, probably. I mean, there's money, I guess there's some money for like CBT, CBD. It's more MMA, but I, I definitely have seen people with. I'm not sure if you're allowed to wear that kind of patch on. Uh, you know, like if you went to IBJ, you would not be allowed to wear that. CBD patches? Yeah. That'd be weird. I mean, it's probably. Wait, wait, do you mean like a skin patch or a D patch? Like a D patch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not, I mean, you probably could get away with wearing a regular patch, but it's under your D or your rash guard, they would never know. Yeah, just slap it on the tank. But. <laughs> I'll edit that part. <laughs> cool. yeah, nobody heard that. The microphone's not that sensitive. <laughs> uh, I don't know where you generally slap it, but that's a personal decision. No, anyway. I won't mind it. Right. Uh, Ooh, I, I, was, I had a brief conversation with someone. Uh, who had a strong opinion uh -oh. about people who join tournaments mm -hmm. uh, and compete in two-man brackets and then get second place and brag about it on the social medias yeah. uh, that they got second place. Yeah, that's not cool. How do you feel about that? I mean, you should not brag that you came in second out of two people. But could you brag that you competed? I think it depends on the situation. Like if somebody, it's like the person who starts off at 400 pounds and then loses 50 pounds and they're still 350. So maybe they're still 100 pounds overweight, right? Uh, but losing 50 pounds is a significant achievement, right? Especially if you've spent a lot of your life not disciplining yourself and not. So that's worth recognition. I would, you know, that person deserves some pretty sense of recognition, right? I respect that. In the same way, if I, if someone says like, look, this is my first tournament and I was really nervous and uh, whatever, right? Like yeah. that person deserves, I mean, it's, it's like, a, I see people who post uh, a lot of posts on people getting stripes on their white belt. And why? Why do they post or why do I why? equate that with celebrating your second place victory out of a, a, a group of two? Why do people, uh, waste time <laughs> belittling people celebrating their minor personal achievements. I'm not, look, I'm not, I'm uh, coming to the point of that, <laughs> I am not belittling them. Although I may roll my eyes. <laughs> These people are still, look, it's still, look, that person uh, put in some effort. It's not easy to just go to a jiu-jitsu class for everybody. Just in the beginning, just go and like suffer the indignities <laughs> and, and pain of uh, both mental and uh, and physical yeah. and emotional yeah. of getting you know coming in and working and getting your first or second or third or whatever getting promoted to blue belt you know looking back but you know looking back like looking at it now I'm like huh, you know like whatever yeah. but like when I was a white belt I was pretty psyched when I got my first strike I and mean, I was pretty psyched when I got my blue belt I was super psyched when I get my blue belt yeah. you know that's an achievement you know that, that I don't know any academy where a blue belt is not considered to be a significant achievement. Yeah. And so, should you go and be like, I'm the best ever, I'm gonna kick everyone's butt because now I'm a blue belt, I'm gonna show you guys, you know, now I'm, you know, that's silly. Yeah. But if you just go in and you say, hey, I, I competed, I was really happy with how I did, maybe I didn't win, but I, I gave him a good, I did the best I could, like, okay, that's fine. But don't, like, what I love is always, uh, you know, you go to, you go to like the worlds, which this is not true anymore, but. If you went to the worlds, you went to Na you went to the worlds. You went to Naga worlds, blue belt worlds, right? Naga world championships. 
and you go in and for some reason you're number two, uh, you know, you win second out of two people. You know, listed on your, on your achievements, silver medalist, <laughs> you know, 2020 silver medalist, the world championship. That is a little misleading. Asterix, asterix, asterix. I don't know. I mean, there's no, and don't get me wrong, like, there's no shame in, and you should be proud of yourself if you go and you win the, if you went to I, uh, IBJJF Worlds and you win the Worlds yeah. or Euros or Pans at Blue Belt, that is a significant achievement. I have a question. Yes. I would say I'm an old man. Yes. And I go to. Like me? Uh, Let's say I'm rich. No, I'm older, right? You're uh, even older than me. Is that possible? Am yeah. I still going to be like, doing jiu-jitsu? Maybe? Slightly older, but you know, in like the last bracket that they could have at Worlds. Masters, know? like, like seven. seven, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And right, and I join uh, the, the tournament, and I there, there's, it's a two-man bracket. Yes. I get second place. That's fine. Can I put in my Instagram profile that I am uh, a Masters World Silver Medalist? You're not lying. I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. You, uh, I think you have to be very careful. I think that person sh deserves a lot of credit. I don't care what age group you are. Uh, if you go in and you like train and you compete, you don't have any control over who shows up at your division. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, look, you could go to Masters 5 and run into like a former world champion who's still really, really good. Yeah. And, uh, and that person could smoke you. There could be 10 people who show up in your Every year that I go to Masters, there's more and more people who show up. But what if there's only one really, 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 really good guy and you and he smokes you? Yes. Can I put that silver medal on my Instagram or on my Tinder? You, <laughs> you totally can do that, but uh, it's, I don't, I don't think that, uh, I think it's fine to say I'm, I'm like, I, I went here, I did this, I competed. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you lead people on to believing that, like if I start doing seminars because I'm So that, it premise, sounds like you're saying it would be appropriate for Tinder, but not for Instagram. <laughs> Where like, you know, we're trying to create I think a, a you good be, niche on one social media and on the other one, it's like our real friends and family. Here's how I would do it. This is, and I can't speak there. Like I, if I went to Worlds and when I'm 75 years old, uh -huh. I would be proud of myself. Yeah. And I'm still, Training and competing in Jiu Jitsu. I'd be proud of you for being able to be proud of I'll be proud if I can make it to next year's Masters at the way I'm going. Mm -hmm. But here's what I would say. If I were to put that on my on my Instagram, <laughs> right, if I put anything on my Instagram, yeah. I would be very careful to note all of those things. I would say, I, this is what I would say. I would say I'm proud of myself, of, my, of just being able to go and compete. There was only one other person in my division and they smoked me, yeah. but I'm still proud of myself. Fair. Right? I got second place out of two people, and you can make fun of me all you want, but when you're 70 years old, you, you know, we'll see where you are. Yeah. Right? I think that those, anybody deserves credit for working hard and, and going and, and uh, taking the chance of competing. You know, and that takes some, that takes some guts uh, and dedication. Uh, but don't come off and be like beating your chest like silver medalist, you know, yeah. and don't give any context to that achievement. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like when you win the the Olympics, but it was like a year that everyone boycotted. Like yeah. everyone who knows knows that you're full of crap. Yeah, except the people who don't know. It's like the people who say, game. and you know, I'm probably going to insult somebody. Uh, they say like, "Oh, I played professional baseball," but you played during a strike year. You're like one of the scab players, oh. right? Like, is that person a really good baseball player? Yeah, probably. They're. I mean, nobody plays professional sports is isn't really good. But other baseball players, other pro baseball players, are going to know. Yeah. what the context is. And you're not going to get any respect from that. So talking about authentic, authentic and sincere and, and not being disingenuous, like, like you have to give context to these things. But you were still, you're just like a guy doing your best, right? Like taking and, you deserve, and you deserve credit for doing your best, But you're right? still a scab? Like, what the F? No, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> you, I think that you should give people credit for, their, for what they've actually accomplished. But if there's a, an asterisk, then you, it's better to give the asterisk yourself than it is for other people to say, oh, you're being fake. Like, you know, like it's like people who say, like people go to masters and win masters. And nowadays, like winning masters is a significant uh, achievement. Yeah. I mean, if you win, you know, masters two at any belt level or any weight level, like you're, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an accomplishment that you should be proud of. Especially because there's going to be a bunch of world champions in your division. <laughs> for real. Yeah, it's true. You're a brown belt or purple belt. You know, um, 
Sean Jay could show up in your division. Yeah. You know, uh, Gregor Gracie could show up in your division. And, you know, so I don't know if Turkey's masters yet, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, but it's still stacked. So, but this is like Josh Hinger's thing of like, don't don't say you're world champion if you won the Masters world champ because there's a difference. It, you you you're not the world champion, right? <laughs> yeah. You're not the world champion. The person who who wins uh, IBJJF adult what black belt. Open weight, or can you say you're, if you're, you're the world if, champion? If you win your weight bracket, or your weight class. Are you the world champion, or are you a world Well, champion? you're at your weight class. You're a world champion. You're the world champion at that weight class. That means a world champion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you win open class, I think then you could say the world champion. The world champion. Yeah, of that year. I think that's <laughs> a, that is a, a, accepted by the community, that that is a legit claim on your behalf. Yeah, and agreed. if you just say, "Hey, I'm a world, I'm a multiple," though, usually you see what happens is, uh, I think Hadolfo was watching the, the promo for his match, and they were talking about like he won the world. He's a, he, and I think he described himself as a five-time world champion, mm. and I think not the five-time world champion. And I'm not sure if he was being or, or whoever was writing. <coughs> that, or, Are there or, other five-time world champions? To make him I mean, Hodger won. Uh, More than five. Yes. So does he? Is Hodger also a five-time world champion in addition to being a six and seven-time world champion? He's like a ten-time world champion. Oh, yeah, yeah. So is he a fifth-time or five-time world champion and a six and a seven and a, and a nine and a ten? Right. So if anyone, like, if you're a nine-time world champion and you're the only nine-time world champion, mm -hmm. and then Hodger's a ten-time world champion, do you have to say that you're a nine-time world champion because Hodger is both a nine-time world champion and a ten-time world champion? I think if you uh, there's all sorts of ways you can qualify <laughs> these things, right? Like some people will say I'm the most decorated American rapper. Yeah. Right? Like and, and certain that, that torch gets passed. Very, very specific in their advertising themselves. And I think that's totally fair because the people that they are advertising to are usually people who are knowledgeable about what they're about the language that they're using anyway. Yeah. Um, it, it, if you if you win Naga Worlds and you walk around and say I'm the <laughs> world champion, people are gonna like check the internet and be like, This guy is full of crap. Yeah. Not, not that you weren't the world champion of that tournament. Just a, well, it's a specific type of world champion. If you win the like, fight to win, you know, world championship, yeah. like you can say like, I'm the, I'm the fight to win world champion. No one's gonna blink at that. They'll be like, okay, that's, uh, I get it. Yeah. But that person, if they, if they just walk around and say, I'm the world champion. You know what I've never understood? <laughs> that's, uh, sorry, uh, like how it works for boxing. Like, cause they don't have like a like a boxing federation, right? Like most of the big. They have like three main, I think three, maybe four, uh, main. Uh, uh, what do they call them? Like promotional companies. They they call them. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They are not promoters. They're they're the three. There's like the WBO sanctioning bodies, mm. and and there are different ones for different countries, and maybe you know, but there's like the WBO. I forget all the different. Uh, but they, what they have is, uh, even though, you know, you have the, like, the world, undisputed world champion, that means somebody who unifies, like, all the, all the major, the three major sanctioned bodies. Mm -hmm. I forget what the WBA, w, whatever, IBF, whatever it's called. Uh, there's three big ones, and then you have what are called lineal champions, right? So, the guys who, you know, like, there was the one world champion, and then he gets beaten, and he, and somebody takes the titles from that person. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not be all three titles, right? But that person held all three. Because sometimes what happens is the sanctioned bodies have, like, required defenses. And sometimes those don't always line up. Like, so you can have different contenders for each sanctioning body because they have different rankings uh, and different rules for who should get matches, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you have these lineal champions of, like, who took the belt from, you know, from Ali, right, Frazier. Right? You know, I don't know all the boxing history. And then who beat Frazier? I think Ali beat him again, and then mm -hmm. who beat Ali? Foreman, and then and then who took it off of Foreman? Larry Holmes. What, what who took it off of Larry Holmes? Michael Spinks. Is that who took it off of Michael Spinks? Or two of the three? Or is three that one three. organization, or bouncing all through three? Or so usually, I think what usually happens is at some point the belts get unified. You know, through not always, but like at some point they, they keep getting unified, so and then they get. They is, fall is there one belt that rules them all? I don't think there's one belt that. I think there's, you generally look at, 
uh, I mean, I think there's a consensus agreement that these are the, the, the guy who beat the guy who beat the guy who beat the guy. And, and if you were, so you can, so look, you can have two guys at each hold of belts. This happens all the time, mm -hmm. right? We have two people. In different organizations. And, and like Tyson reunified the belts, uh -huh. I think. I mean, he, he basically went after, he basically goes and gets fights of all the people who hold the important belts. He beats the hell out of them and he holds all three. He unifies the title. Mm -hmm. And then the guy who beats him, Buster Douglas, is the next lineal champion just but for the organization that put on that fight, they get that belt, not all three. Well, no, because look, I mean, if the if the if two of the three sanctioning bodies are, are sanctioning the fight, then the third body is not that belt's not on the line. Okay, so they're basically do, saying this challenger is not belt. our body. Okay. The guy we think should be the challenger. It's, two. it's all money. So it could just be one and one, right? Like, let's say, are the organizational bodies involved with the fight fighter camps and their people? Are they? I think like, those are promoters. Do you do the promoters work for the organization, no. or yeah, it's just like hey, we're going to go over to these guys? We want to fight. We want to put us on. No, yeah, maybe we go over here, see what they offer. And I then, think what happens is that the sanctioning bodies are usually seen to me. I mean, I'm just a lady. I'm not a boxing expert by any stretch. Uh -huh. The the what happens? If this is to me as a complete lay observer. Is that a boxer can go throughout their entire career and just fight chumps? Yeah. And that could be very entertaining and very lucrative, right? You just have two guys that go at it. Um, and you see this a lot where, where prospects are getting padded titles or they're getting practice, right? Or not padded titles, but you get padded records. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, you want to have some legitimacy to a fight. You want to, you know, like if you're a fighter, you want to like fight really good people so that you get a title, right? Like so that people recognize you as the champion. And then that becomes very lucrative in and of itself. So. So at some point you have to, you, you participate, you kind of say like, okay, who's, who are your top 10? Who are your top 10 fighters? So these are guys that are out fighting them. They have their own wins and losses or, you know, maybe they're undefeated. And they're seeing that there's a, a, a legitimacy, right? It's not just me saying as a promoter or the fighter that this guy's really good and you should really be impressed if I beat that person or if they beat me. We have a sanctioning body, they rank fighters. And according to this sanctioning body, this is the number one fighter. But there are three or the champion bodies? At least three. There's more than three. There's a lot of them. There's three main ones. Three big ones. And are the smaller ones like subdivisions of them? Or no, they they're, they're independent organizations. Like and they might be regional, right? There's one in Europe. There's one in Africa. I'm sure there's one in Latin America. There are probably ten in Latin America. There's, there's sanctioning bodies in, um, in, uh, in Mexico. There's probably ten. You know, every state, I mean, not I shouldn't say every state. That's, every, that's a different box commission will have, every state will usually have a boxing commission. Um, but uh, in general, you know, the, bo the boxing commissions and the, and the rank, the sanctioning organizations are working together too. Because the, the boxing commissions want to make sure things are safe and legit. And so the sanctioning bodies are a way to kind of... Do they go in between like the, like the legal entities that make sure people are doing things the right way, like in terms of... Like, I think there's certain the rules that have to be followed. Yeah. Right, and that's a, that's also that's a both a so like the sanctioning bodies may have different rules about you know standing eight counts or how many rounds or how long the rounds will be or so what there, the point system is. Is there not a unified rule set for all three sanction bodies? Uh, the rule sets change from state to state. Oh. So Las Vegas has its rules, and and you might be able to you know you know Alabama may not have any rules. I'm pretty sure they don't. Mm -hmm. You know if you go into an Indian reservation. They're gonna have. They don't. They're not subject. But if you want to have, you know, if, if you want to have fights recognized, then I think you have to follow certain rules. So I'm not sure what. I know that each state, each boxing commission has its own rules, uh, but they they might have also like kind of placeholders that say, hey, listen, if it's one of these three major sanctioning bodies rules, then that's okay with us. So we don't dictate what the rules are per se. There might be some like rules that they are mandating, but like like safety rules. Mm -hmm. And kind of and making sure that uh, everybody's getting paid the right way, and there's yeah. there's there's like doctors in, in presence, you know, like there's all these safety and like also how does gambling run into it? So depends on the state. So in New York, you you're not allowed to gamble, uh -huh. right? And so if you're going to gamble on the fight, you got to do it in Vegas or so through you, Vegas. So you can go to Vegas to gamble on fights or call Vegas. your bookie in Vegas, or you know, your your bookmaker is not. Casino will take your bet, right? So it's 
totally legit, but then you have to make sure that there's everything's on the up and up. So like you make sure that like the doctor's independent, the ref's independent, the, and the judges are independent. And if you're betting on these things, you want to make sure that there's that the, the judge, you know, two of the judges aren't like related to the promoter Wait, of this who, one fight. Who would be in charge of making sure that all of that is going as it should? So the commission is, I mean, it depends on the profile of the fight, but the commission is generally, there'll be a commission, you'll have to have a, a, somebody from the commission who's there, and then sometimes the commission will require that you select judges from the, the commission's pre-approved list of judges. Huh. They have to be qualified in some certain way. Yeah. Um, not to say they're good, yeah. right? You're, you're not gonna get always good and the most qualified judges, but you're gonna get judges that at least you know don't have a financial relationship or filial relationship or familial uh, relationship with the boxer or the promoter or, you know, whatever. So you have to have this the sort of bureaucracy set up in order to be able to gamble on it in Vegas, right? Yeah, Vegas has its own rules, right? Um, I mean, and, and the bookmakers want to make sure things are fair too because they don't want to get taken yeah. advantage of. So, I mean, so right now there isn't gambling on jiu-jitsu, is there? Like legal gambling? In uh, I don't know if there's any, there's gambling on MMA. MMA. You could definitely gamble on definitely. MMA. There probably, I think there was some gambling, like based in Russia for, uh, for jiu-jitsu, I think. But uh, yeah, I, it, I'm sure there's some you could probably do it online. Yeah, somewhere. I've, I've seen uh, sketchy internet ads for it, but I haven't. I don't know. I, I haven't heard of it being. It's official. probably not lucrative enough to actually cause like Vegas to be interested in it. Yeah, but I would be interested in. And also, you need a bookmaker, right? Like you need somebody who knows the sport enough so that the casino is like. We, yeah. we can handicap these things but, yeah. correctly. Well, once you once you get gambling involved, then the statistics comes in, and you get people who are starting to, to really analyze the numbers of jujitsu. That's what I want. I want. I want. Yeah. Well, you know, like Flow Grappling publishes a lot of data. Yeah. And you could you could uh, I mean you can generate like you can see on uh, on BJJ Heroes they'll they'll list out like pretty much everyone's wins and losses. I don't know yeah. if they're still doing that. But like like baseball level. You know, where, yeah. where you're really getting intricate with your analysis and, yeah. you know, really being able to crunch numbers. And I don't think we're there yet. That'd be cool. Eventually. I, I think uh, I think it's highly problematic. Yeah. Well, it's very, it's so complicated. So. No, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's the, the, I think that gambling on sports, like pro sports is fine, I guess. I don't know. I'm not mm -hmm. really opposed to it, but I wouldn't. There's a lot of things that it's like it's like investing in a company you know nothing about in the yeah. industry you're not familiar. I mean, maybe you're familiar. With. Are there things you that have no you have no insight into that? Yeah, I've been generally told not to gamble unless you know it's a for sure thing. No such thing. And then if it is for sure, it's probably something illegal going on. No, like if it's your illegal thing, then <laughs> yeah, you should be gambling. You should be betting on yourself. <laughs> I mean, there's just like in in, in like the NFL and the NBA, like stuff like injury reports really. You know, you don't get that that level of uh, you know insider visibility into jujitsu athletes generally, yeah. right? And so, even MMA, you see, you hear about people who have tough camps and get infections or sick or have a bad weight cut. Um, it, I think it's fun from an entertainment perspective, but yeah. I mean, well, then I wonder if there's like a jujitsu equivalent of like point shaving, or if you start getting athletes who are would, kind of just like would. playing with the game. You you probably would. I mean, there's you know the thing is is that. Uh, in, in professional sports, if you get busted doing that, you'll get drummed out of the league. Yeah. It's just a huge financial disincentive. Like if you're, so that's the, like one of the problems in college is that because they don't pay college athletes, they're incentivized. They're incentivized to make money on the side by doing point shaving or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Once you start paying the players, then they have an incentive, if you pay them well, well to not get booted out of the league for betting on, their, on games. Yeah. Uh, so well, is that illegal to do? Yeah, you're not allowed to bet. Well, I mean, I know like, like Pete Rose got I mean, I would definitely, if I was an owner, put it into my contract that you're not allowed to do it, but like, is it against the law to shave points if you're a, yeah, because you're just like being, you're engaged in a corrupt activity, but like, you're engaged in a conspiracy to fix your job is, to, your job event. is to win the sporting event, not it's to not, not do your best all the time. It's not your job isn't to do your best hundred percent all the time. That doesn't, you're just. Just like less 
for that's true, but you what you can't do is you game. can't you can't sell you can't you can't corrupt the game. You're not selling you can't engage. So this is this is what happens when like in business, yeah. you know, people you know, you have to report your quarterly results. And so if you massage those numbers mm -hmm. at a certain point, it becomes less about, you know, uh, just massaging numbers to look good, it becomes more deception, right? And people are buying and selling based on your representations of what your company is doing, yeah. right? And so a lot of times people think, you know, executives, and I've had cases involved in this where it's like, you know, what's the harm? Like, what's the harm? I, I, I misstated this business's results by, a, you know, like let's say there's hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, mm -hmm. and, and I, I, I massage the numbers to a point I like that verb. Like it's so. It sounds so innocent. Like, right. I'm, not, I'm just. I'm I manipulate the numbers. I'm just massaging. I'm massaging. <laughs> but but what happens is you know the stock goes up or down, uh, and people are betting both ways, right? Some people who bet that stock to go up or stay even or or go down. Somebody, if, you, if whatever you're lying about has an impact on some part of the market. Right? Yeah, but nobody you know. Yeah, that's not how it works. <laughs> so it's the same way when you're when you're you know point shaping. It's because people are betting on the game, assuming that betting is even legal in the first place, yeah. right? Then you are harming somebody through your action because you're cheating, right? It's, it's a corrupt thing to do. Yeah, but what do friends do tomorrow? Well, <laughs> you know, we all have our personal decisions to make, but uh, you could go to jail for that, right? So it's fair. Be aware. Not a smart thing to do. Don't gamble. I mean, gambling's fine. I don't have a problem with gambling, but uh, you know, don't don't gamble the house, right? <laughs> don't gamble your mortgage. That's the problem where, where it really goes, you and, know, haywire. And don't gamble on things you're directly involved in. That. that well, was, I mean, there's there's a I mean, at least in investment, there's an idea of I mean, not buying and selling your own company, right? Like yes. you can do that, but there's a, there are specific ways to do it so that you avoid the appearance of you know impropriety or, or mm -hmm. corruption, but. There is something to say, like if I'm very, familiar, if I've worked in an industry for a long time and I know that industry very well, then that's a that's a good place for me to buy to invest. Mm -hmm. So I'm not investing based on any kind of like not public information that I or somebody else, you know, that either I know independently, but what I sit if, on the board of a company. Or well, a if, you're like, if you're like a, a leader in that, can you there are ways industry? to buy and sell that don't like you can you can put things in like an automatic sell or automatic buy mode. Um, or you can do it in a way that you do it so many days out from when you're announcing results so that you make sure that it's not, you know, you're not, you're not benefiting from whichever swing or, or even stability that the stock might have or whatever financial instrument. But uh, yeah, you, there's ways to do it intelligently if you know the industry really well. Like you can, I mean, look, if you, if you follow college sports religiously and you are informed, you know, uh, what's the word, you know, informed viewer, yeah. Or, or then, yeah, okay, betting might make sense, but uh, don't bet the house. Don't bet your car. Yeah. Don't bet the kids more. You know, kids' college fund. That's that's the problem. People can't control. This. But that's when it that's when it feels the best. Ah. Uh. <laughs> when when you when you skirt that like you almost lost everything line, but then everything's okay. Then your brain just fills with dopamine, and you're just like oof. And even though you know you don't want to do it, you just you can't forget. I remember brain. when I uh, the first time I ever went to Atlantic City. You know, you go into Atlantic, it's all terrible. It's all, I mean, I don't know what it's like now, but when I was a kid and I went in, I mean, it was like just a, a like a retail wasteland. It was like nothing. Uh, everything was boarded up. The only thing, the only businesses that seemed to be thriving around the the casinos were pawn shops and <laughs> uh, and like car dealerships where you could trade in. Yeah. You know, there were some nice cars, cars out in the, yeah, you know, in the cool. used car uh, lot. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's not a pretty, it's not a pretty picture. Yeah. You know, I don't. I can make jokes, but. There are know. people who do make, like, that are professional poker players and make a lot of money playing poker or backing it or whatever mahjong. You know, there are people that are very sophisticated um, or disciplined. Gamblers. Yeah, but what do you think the ratio of disciplined and sophisticated to... There's a reason why <laughs> casinos make money. You know, this is why, you know, people, when, whenever uh, people tell me or, or say that, like, Trump was a really good businessman, I'm like, if you can't run a casino where all the odds are in your favor, 
like not just a little bit, right? But overwhelmingly in your favor. If you can't make money doing that, I bet I you bet you are terrible as a business person. I, I bet it's because all the other casinos are involved with. It's uh, all a grand cons conspiracy. Uh, mob money and Trump was the no, only. No, he was honest, in bed with the mob no, too. No, Trump was the only honest politician who won't <laughs> uh mob money. So he he his business. Actually, there's there's been a lot of a lot of stories written about all the associations uh, between. The Trump family and Trump's dad and him and like the, the Jersey mob. I don't know anything about that. Or the Phil and the Philadelphia. That doesn't mob. sound like the Trump I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, not that you know. Look, uh, it's not a good, it's not a good thing to get into. I don't think, unless you are very sophisticated, you make a lot of money. <laughs> well, like, doesn't how do you, like no one starts sophisticated and intelligent, right? Like, no, that's everyone not, that's everyone not true. goes through that. That phase where they're just like flopping around no. on the floor no. through life, and then eventually they start figuring out what's going on, no. and then gradually they can start like doing stuff, no. and then they pick themselves off the ground, and then they're eventually sophisticated and intelligent. No. How do you go from being a sucker <clears throat> to a not sucker in this context? Step one: be really good at math. But if you're not good at math, like me, I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't have a brain that can like. But like good of math. Then you should math. not be involved in gambling. What right? is gambling good is math. math. What's that? But what does good at math mean? Uh, calculating odds. Odds. Yes. Like just specifically that skill. Being able to count cards. But that's, nobody, a good, that's a good skill. Nobody now. starts. If you, if you can count cards. Nobody starts good at counting cards. Yeah. Like how do you know that yeah. you're going to do this thing? You know, like you just no and nobody no. I mean, it's like it's like this, Kevin. Yeah. It's like the guy or the or the person who walks in the door, and they just seem to have like a natural talent for like passing the guard. What does that happen? That happens very rarely. A net, yeah. Once in a while, there's a person who comes in and has like a knack. They just have a sense. I we guess. see that it's in the kids, right? Like there are some kids that are like they just seem to take to it. No, all kids are have potential and they're no. great. And I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. All kids have capable. potential. But some kids start a little bit further along than other kids. This is true in every sport. Every sport. But like, there's one kid who just has a little bit better hand-eye coordination. Yeah, but there's eventually, one kid that, just like eventually a bit, that hand eye -less, coordinationless kid can learn jujitsu. Yes, that Why is true. Why can't an idiot learn that how to true. count cards? You can. You can. Any. Not I'm about any idiot. It takes some degree of, of proficiency. But yes, I could train myself to count cards. Like I'm, I'm, I'm confident I could do it. Yeah. But the work that I would be, need to put in <laughs> to learn how to count cards itself is indicative of the, the fact that I'm not that good. How, how long do you think you could do it? Then? How long do I think if I just if I just if decided you, like I'm gonna learn how to count cards like today? An hour a day. Uh, I don't know. Cause, cause remember we need to set a goal for the next couple. Weeks. Rich is gonna learn how to count cards. Uh huh. Uh, I don't know. It would take me. It would take a long time. Whatever the whatever the outside uh, <laughs> time period is, I would be at that time period. Now, if you ask me to read a book, right? Like I could read a book really fast. If you, if, I can read books. I can read. Um, if you said, Rich, I need you to research something, I can research. Wait, it. like read it and then remember yeah. things in it, or yeah. just read it? Read it, remember it, digest it, analyze it, break it down, explain it. All right. So, can you read a? a book about counting cards and then... Yes, that's what I would do. That would be step one. I would go to the thing that I'm very good at. I would be like, okay. Some people would go and go get a video. Yeah. Some people, like my mother, my mother is excellent at math and she could just count cards. Your mother counts she cards? She intuitively knows how to count cards. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because she started playing uh, cards when she was a girl and she learned how to like figure out what the chances are that you had, a, you know, given the cards that she knew were out there uh, and how many were left in the deck. She had a good sense of like what cards were in your hand, yeah, and what her what her given her cards or whatever her draw was like her chances of winning. Mm -hmm. She just good at that. She just figured it out. She didn't have to sit down and teach herself how to how to count cards. She just was like, she yeah. just knew. I think it's easier to be intuitive with one deck. And you're playing like well. That's why they, they have the when you go to the computer. Vegas and you, the shoe has like seven or twelve decks or yeah, something. Yeah, that's so, when it's crazy. But there are people that can actually. It might take more than a couple, but there are people who can count the cards even in a in, a, in that kind of deck. And isn't it usually like a two person system? Yeah, we could, or more. No, they already have the, the, the MIT had a team had teams that would do that. Yeah, I saw that movie with Kevin Spacey. Or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
What was it? It was, it was a movie. But they, they had like a rotating cast of people because, you know, like once you start showing up and winning, they just start tracking you. Yeah. Right? So you can't have the same person. And then they started communicating, right? Because then they would go from casino to casino. No, then we could combine our love of math and our love of disguise. First of all, I don't have any love for math. I'm terrible at you math. You play so much hard stuff. You don't That's like true, math. but I, you know, like the odds are not. Like I, now I have a sense of odds, but uh, it's not the same as like, it's not like, like the way I look at it, it's like beautiful mind. You know, some people just see the cards and just know, and other people are like, eh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But you can't win on just pretty sure. Like you have to know, like every professional poker player is is running the numbers in their heads. But like, like, ev like every serious person just knows the numbers. Do, is it a knowing like they go through it step by step? No, they like just, really they, they, quickly, they've learned it enough now that they like, know. Is it intuitive to them or is it like they have a system and they follow the system? And I mean, I can't speak for every person, but my sense is that whatever, however they get to it, they have, they know the numbers. And it's not just so, like, everyone knows Texas Hold'em, but there are other, yeah. there are other games that, like, if you go to the World Series of Poker, there's, like, I think four games that they play. Mm -hmm. And so you could get a bracelet on, there's, like, Omaha, there's uh, Texas Hold'em. They get bracelets? Yeah, they have a bracelet. Oh, I don't want a bracelet. Well, good luck. No, 10,000 bucks to, to no, go and do it. like, jujitsu should do bracelets. bracelets. So each, each, they have rings. rings. I mean, jujitsu has rings, I think. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's jujitsu. A pinky ring would be cool. There you go. You get whatever you want. I mean, you could always put whatever, you know. Yeah. But whatever your fingers you want. are super small. I'm sorry. Um, whew. Math. It's math. Hard. I like math. I mean, if you like math, then. I won't do it, but I like it. Like uh, art, you know? I, I like it. I like watching videos about it. I, I don't want to do it. You don't want to do it? Not really. I mean,. Nah, nah, nah. I don't think you have to be that good. So the, the thing is, is like, if you are, like I know when I went to Vegas, I used, uh, I used to go to play Texas Hold'em. I love Texas Hold'em. I don't play any other games because they're, you're basically going to lose. At best you have a, you know, if you play blackjack, like you could have a system and maybe you'll. Maybe with that attitude. You definitely have to count cards for blackjack. Um, or you have to, not count cards, but there's a system and it has odds and there's like a, a very, and you can, I don't know if you know this, right? Like you go and you sit down at the blackjack table the dealer will tell you what you should do, what the right move is in each. That's how that's how you know the game is fixed, right? When the dealer is telling you what you should do and is right, they're not BSing you. Like they'll get fired, they'll get in trouble if they don't tell you the exact. Well, thing. you yeah. have to memorize. There's a card that you can get. There's whole systems, whatever. But they'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, with Texas Hold'em, you're not. You have to pay to the house. Like there's an. Uh, the house gets a. I forget what they call Buy? it. No cut. No. They get it. They get a, a cut out of every. Yes. Right. But, uh, but generally you're not playing against the house. Yes. Right. So you are playing against everyone else. And so like, look, if you go to, if you, now it depends on the table that you go to, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you go to the four, eight table, you know, that's a, that's a bunch of small timers, mm -hmm. right? If you go to the, you know, there's a no limit room, that's serious people who know how to play mm -hmm. and they are all doing the math in their heads. Uh -huh. So like, what you see is at the, at the smaller tables, You'll have a, a, a couple, there's usually one or two, like, real people there. And they're, they're small timers. They're just taking money off of the tourists. Yeah. But they, they, have, they always have the big stacks. They're not always there. They're off on lunch or whatever like that. Um, so you can make money. You can make a, a modest living yeah. by just going and sitting at the, at the low limit tables yeah. and just taking money off a of tourist. Like, I sit down for two hours, right? Let's yeah. say I sit down. Some people sit down for two days. If I sit down for two hours, like, I just want to have fun. I have like a couple more bucks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. play. I've heard this strategy, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I just go play. And then the person who's like sitting at the table all day says they're nine to five. Yeah, they're they're gonna take that action, right? They're they're gonna wait for me to make a silly play. A, you know, and they just they know they're good players, yeah. and so they're just gonna over time. You know, they have there's usually I think eight people at a table, maybe ten. I haven't been there in a long time, but let's say there's eight people. There's two pros. They know each other. Yeah. Right. And then or whatever. They're not pro pros, but they're that's what they they're do. real people. Yeah. It's their job. And they just sit around the table taking turns, you know, taking money off the tourists. Yeah. And that's an honest living, I guess, you yes. know, and, and when I'm happy, sometimes I beat them and sometimes I don't. Usually you don't because I'm only I'm playing for a limited amount of time. Yeah. They never make a bad play. Yeah. They never make a bad play because that's bad for business for them. So you can make a living that way. I guess if that's how you want to spend your time. But that's a, I mean, that's a, you got to be committed. Like it, it's hard. It is actually hard work, I think, to sit in a, 
smoky card room for 10 to 12 hours a day. There are worse jobs though. That's true. I don't know. There are better jobs though. There are better jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much money they actually make, but I'm sure it's not terrible living Seems in Vegas. Like enough, All right, guys. Take it easy.